I would like for you to join me as I welcome my dear friend, Baba Haru Ankarad Samaj Se Patha. He is the chief priest of the Shrine of Patha. Join me as I welcome him to African Scholar. So I want to ask you a question. What led you to the comedic understanding, uh, to the comedic theology, uh, to the comedic culture? What, because none of us were born into it. True. What led you to it? We all were led to it mm -hmm. by some circumstance. What led you? Well, I may be the exception to the rule. I was born into it in this wise. My father, he was a Christian minister. And um, he told me later on as I grew up that I was born specifically for the mission of introducing our people to the Nile Valley culture. And um, he was a follower of Marcus Garvey. And he said that um, as I grew up and, and I matured, we have these conversations. And he would say that his reading of the Bible indicates that African people are children of Ham. Um, but he said that the original name in the Hebrew was Kom, and that the original name for the place now called Egypt was Kemet. So therefore, which means the Kem in the ancient language means burnt, blackened, or hot. So that uh, King James uh, did not add the K when he called us children of Ham. And he said, my work was to study the Nile Valley culture and as I grow up to teach our people about that culture because he said that's, that was the culture from which Judaism came, from which Christianity came, and from which Islam came because all the major prophets went into the Nile Valley in Africa to get what they got in terms of knowledge. Moses was taught in the temples of, of Anu for 40 years. Abraham and Sarah, when they came before Moses, they grew rich in cattle and land because of the hospitality of the Africans of the Nile. Yeshua, now known as Jesus, his life was spared by the hospitality of these same Nile Valley Africans and also that the Prophet Muhammad's 40, um, at least 40 of his disciples were spared from the wrath of his uh, tribesmen, the Quraysh of Mecca, when he sent them to the Negus Negusti, the king of kings of Ethiopia, to be spared their wrath and to give them refuge. So it seems that Africa, the Nile Valley Africans gave refuge to all of these major prophets. So the question is, what kind of people were these? What did they know? What did they believe in? What was their concept of deity before the coming of the Shemitic um, shepherds? Um, actually, what we refer to, unfortunately, as gods and goddesses are facets and attributes of Ankara. Ankara, or some say Netcher, is the undifferentiated divinity that governs all creation. If you, as a jeweler, I look at a gem, I look at a diamond, and I see that the diamond has many facets, each throwing off, depending on how the light hits it, a different light. Okay, and Ankara, divinity, undifferentiated, has many aspects and many expressions. Our ancestors used animals, they used birds, they used reptiles to describe aspects of these, of divinity. Uh, if you go into the Christian Bible, it'll say, Be ye wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It'll also say, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider his ways and be wise. So the Bible is saying that ants, doves, and serpents can teach you wisdom can teach you, you know, uh, if you observe them, they have aspects of human behavior. So our ancestors felt the same way about the lion, about the, the cynocephalus uh, um, uh, um, baboon. They felt the same way about the ibis and the jackal and all of those animals. Now, the, the Egyptologists, when they come, they willfully choose to misunderstand our way of life and accuse us of animal worship. You are adorned with many of the um, jewelry that you make in your studio, and I would like to begin perhaps with the symbol that's on your hat. And so if you can just explain the jewelry that my viewers are looking at from the Scarab Kepra and to the Ankh, would you please do that for us? 
I'd be happy to. Um, my design of what I call joy Ellery, because it gives me joy to bring our ancestral emblems of culture to the fore, is actually the outgrowth of the reclamation of the ancient culture of the Nile Valley Africans. Being people from the uh, Africans in the West, we have the choice of claiming any part or any aspect of African culture that we wish. I chose the Nile Valley because it's the oldest, most successful and longest lasting. And of course, it is the one from which even the Yoruba claim they came, the Akan, the Dogon, the Wolof, they all claim they came from the Nile Valley regions. So I create these emblems of culture because they're actually meditations on inner beauty, meditations for the soul. Like when I wear, the, when I put this on in the morning, this is the, um, this is the emblem of Heru, which the Greeks call Horus. Um, the, we use the, the bird, the falcon, to symbolize the, um, the ascension in spirit. Just like in the Christian faith, they use the dove. They say Jesus ascended as a dove to his father in heaven. Um, the, the Hu, or Nebhu, uh, which they call the Sphinx, likewise. Um, this is an emblem of, of, of the permanence and the lion spirit of African people. I wonder if my cameraman can come in and um, get that clear. I don't know. Uh, while you're going to talk, we, right. we, we try to the, figure it out. You asked yeah. me about the emblem of my hat. Well, that's a lotus petal. And while many people uh, assign the lotus to the, um, to the Indians, because many of them have a lotus sutra, let's mm -hmm, say, of mm -hmm, meditation, mm -hmm. The, the, the first and oldest lotus master was known as Asar, whom the Greeks call Osiris. And you will see on the papyrus um, of, the, of the Book of the Coming Forth, which they mis willfully mislabel the Egyptian Book of the Dead, you will see that a lotus is growing out of the feet of Asar, and on that lotus are the four genii, or the four guardians of the body temple, known as the, the um, Mesuheru, the the children of Heru, yes. which guard the lungs, the liver, the small intestine, the large intestine and stomach. And those organs were placed in separate jars and preserved in the resting place of our ancestors. So the, um, these emblems, the, the bracelet I wear, these are the eyes of Heru. The, um, you see, the, uh, yes. the eyes of Heru, which symbolizes balanced vision, attention, attentiveness, and, and also the... Um, awareness all right so each time when i put these on here i have the the lo this lotus ring i was born in the sign of the lion so i have the lion made of four different metals the yellow gold white gold bronze and 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 uh and silver and here of course i have the meditation on heru again um the scarab um the ancestors would put when you when you died they would put a scarab over the heart symbolizing that this person will come into being again or the spirit of the person would resurrect. As a matter of fact, the early Christians of Alexandria in Kemet, now miscalled Egypt, they referred to Yeshua, Jesus, as the good scarab. All right? So it was not a worship of a beetle. It was the beetle represents the constant coming of the being, something like the metamorphosis of the butterfly from a, uh, from a slug it becomes a, a butterfly and grows wings. So it shows a symbol of transformation. All right? because the, the, uh, the, the beetle, known as the dung beetle, it rolls its eggs up in a ball of dung, and the, the, the larva eats and, and nourishes itself from the nourishment of the dung, and, um, and come into the world and goes and gathers dung and does the same thing ad infinitum. So it became uh, the symbol of coming into being, which our ancestors call Keper or Kepera. And you have forgot the ankh, now don't forget the ankh. Oh, of course, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they're calling me the ankh man. <laughs> yes. And uh, this divine sign, this is the, the um, preeminent sign of the African spiritual high culture because it honors, first of all, the mother, the womb. It honors the father and the synthesis, the children that comes from the womb through the seed of the father. It also symbolizes the water that rises up from the earth up to the clouds, falling back on the earth as rain to bring vegetation out of the ground. It also is spirit, mind, and matter. So however you look at Ankh, it shows the continue, uh, continuous regeneration of the life force. Now when the Romans um, adopted Christianity in order to co-opt it, they removed the sacred womb as the symbol because the earliest Christians in Alexandria 
used the Ankh as their sign of early Christianity. They just adopted it from the early Africans of the Nile Valley. And, and of course, they themselves were African people like St. Augustine and whatnot. They all were living and, and, uh, in, uh, in Alexandria region. So the emperor uh, Theodosius, I think in the 6th century BC, um, uh, I'm sorry, AD, he um, had an edict that closed the temple of, of, um, of Asta or Set on the island of Philae and banned the Ankh as the preeminent symbol of the early Christians. And then when Constantine um, came, he um, substituted the, the Roman sword, which is now the cross, as the symbol of that religion. So it's time that um, when we see how the patriarchal hierarchies of all the major religions are dealing in, in wars and death, it's time we restore the life principle, a respect for life. When people, I ride in cabs and they ask me, what's your religion? I say, take a deep breath with me. You've just joined my religion. <laughs> what kind of religion is that? I said, it's the aim of all religions, life. Yes. There's nothing bigger, better than life. Even cockroaches want to live. You try to get them and they're, they're running. The fastest thing they're running, fastest. They? <laughs> Why? Well, they're running for their lives. Yeah, yeah. So life must be the most important thing. So now all I have to do is respect your life, you respect my life, and that's the end of war.